gentlemen, please welcome Sam Abood. Thank you. Uh, my name's Sam Abood, and I'm here to talk to you about EU law. Comedy gold, of course. Uh, now, uh, my research is basically about when we should have more integration in the EU or less integration on a given topic. Uh, and one of the things that I have noticed is that the context for this debate is very difficult to have, especially in England with the rise of UKIP. My big problem with Nigel Farage isn't his position on the EU as fabulously ill-informed as it is, it's the fact that he pronounces his name Farage, and not, and not how it's written, Farage. It's garage, not garage, unless you've got a butler. So that's my problem with him. Now, when we try and have a discussion and try and think about the EU, the problem is that, in, in England at least, we're really cack-handed at handling multiculturalism. And that was brought home to me when I read an article in the newspapers a couple of weeks ago that said uh, a school in Buckingham had started teaching its kids Chinese. Fabulous. But then it quoted the teacher as saying, yes, but to make it more fun, while they're learning Mandarin, we teach them Kung Fu. So, <laughs> so basically what you're doing is, you're doing something good, but you're doing the national stereotype at the same time. Now, I worry if those morons in Buckingham Grammar School start teaching other languages by using the national stereotype to make it more fun. So imagine this, Arabic class. Good evening, children. Today we are going to learn the Arabic language. And to make it more fun, we're going to put together this little detonator. <laughs> I think the only language where doing the national stereotype would encourage the kids to learn the language has got to be Dutch. Today, children, we are going to learn about the Dutch language. And to make it more fun, we're going to have a shitload of drugs and have sex. Bring in the blonde girls and the blonde guys. <laughs> so, we are not good at having multiculturalism. Okay? And this is the problem in trying to write and think about something like the EU. Um, and the other problem, the other barrier, is that we tend to think of the EU as a very drab, boring, grey institution full of grey civil servants. Well, I worked in the EU, I was fortunate enough to work there for a bit, and I can tell you it's an incredibly diverse cultural mix, and they are incredibly politically incorrect. For example, I had two German colleagues amusingly called Gunnar. Well, Gunnar, which I pronounced Gunnar. And even, uh, <laughs> even better, as a patriotic Brit, their offices were at opposite ends of the corridors. Hence, front Gunnar and rear Gunnar. <laughs> Matters came to a bit of a head when that name stuck. And even the head of the unit, who was a very dapper French guy, very politically correct, is having a meeting with me one day. We're trying to think of which of the two gunners I'm meant to talk to about a case. And he goes in frustration, oh no, Sam, I am not sure which gunner, but it is the rear gunner. Go and talk to the rear gunner. So even the French guy had started using the, uh, that kind of politically incorrect term. Matters came to a head in the commission when they appointed a scouser as head of IT. Uh, by that, I'm, I don't mean there was a spate of hubcap thefts in the commission. <laughs> uh, it was simply that he called everyone big boy. Uh, everyone, mainly the men. We had some butch women, but they never deserved the title big boy. Um, and he went around calling everyone big boy. Now, this shows how culturally, culturally diverse the commission is, because the men who are north of Germany thought it was hilarious. Ah, people are calling me big boy, it's hilarious. But the guys from the south thought it was insulting to be called big boy, except for Claudio. Claudio is our resident Italian who once commented, sometimes I invite him into my room to, so that he call me big boy when I'm having periods of low self-esteem. <laughs> So, so the, the idea that they're culturally drab and a bit boring, there's also a Dutch guy who 
saw that one of our Swedish colleagues had had a repetitive strain injury. And you know how you have to wrap up the wrist? So he referred to him as a miser kiker, uh, which actually means he who leads the wanking. <laughs> Um, now, obviously, he meant that this guy was a prodigious masturbator. But I quite like the idea that leads the wanking implies that there's some kind of black tie suit, you know, at the party. And that the person who leads the wanking goes, gentlemen, shall we? Shall we adjourn? There's a room with a load of biscuits on the floor. Uh, so. So that's, that, that's the commission, that's the commission, and it's not drag, and it's not culturally all the same. We haven't become culturally harmonised, that's bollocks, right? But when you're trying to think of this and look at it from a research perspective, my problem is I then look at judgments of the European courts, and I say they're preventing people from moving less than before, uh, more than before. And why is that? Well, it's because the political pressure is impacting on the European court. Um, and that breaks the pact. What's the pact? Well, in the EU, you have free movement of goods, of services, of capital, and of people. The services, the goods, and the capital are for the benefit of rich countries like us, and yes, we are rich. Um, the free movement of workers is for the poorer countries, where we have more jobs and they come to us. So, if you break the pact and say, no, no, we don't want any more workers, well, they'll say, fine, but we don't want your goods, and we don't want your services, we don't want your lawyers, we don't want your... Uh, accountants, etc., etc., um, and this can lead to uh, you know legal problems, but it can lead to social problems. And what are the social problems? Well, if it's open season to attack EU immigrants, say they don't integrate, they don't integrate, they don't integrate like Farage does. They don't integrate, they don't integrate. <laughs> okay, then the argument becomes well, oh, we're anti-all immigration, and it becomes we open up the wounds again. Uh, talking about all immigrants. And this was brought home in David Starkey, a famous Tudor historian, who's always on bloody telly, saying how many the was fat. Okay, we get it. Um, uh, he, said that the, he said recently that the riots that we had in England a few years ago were because black people had taught white people how to be violent. Oh. He said that. And that's why, when you have this culture of blaming immigrants, you have people saying that. So not only is that in evolution, he didn't have any evidence, he just said there are white people, there are black people, there were riots, and there's rap music. And that's all the evidence. <laughs> now, the, the problem is that in evolutionary terms, it's retarded, isn't it? The idea that there were white cavemen and black cavemen acting in different ways. So in, in Starkey's version, the black cavemen was fighting off the saber-toothed tiger. In, the white cavemen in Starkey's version was probably sitting there writing a stiff letter to the ombudsman. Dear sir, yet again, because of lack of fencing in the cave area, the dinosaurs have entered my cave, killed two of my children, and shat in my pond. And I, for one, will not stand for it. That's bollocks, isn't it? It's clearly nonsense. And I worry that, you know, there are loads of instances where, black pe where white people have been violent completely unprovoked. <coughs> How about if Starkey started applying his theories to important historical events, like the Holocaust? It's clearly white people's idea. But in Starkey's version, Hitler and Himmler probably got the idea of some black guy they met on a Club 18 to 35 holiday in Jamaica. <laughs> <laughs> and they're sitting there on a, on a banana boat, and Hitler saying to Himmler, So, Herr Deloy, this is a very interesting idea, what you are saying about the Jews. Because at the moment, all we are doing with the Jews is lobbing the odd brick into their window and making them wear the Star of David on their arm. What do you think we should do with the Jews? There ain't nothing for it, man. You got to move all out. You got to have a final solution. <laughs> Crikey, this sounds most definitive. What would this final solution entail, Herr Deloy? That he had nothing for it, man. You got to have murder on an industrial scale. <laughs> Crikey, for us Germans to perpetuate violence in the 20th century would be unheard of. Well, if nothing else, you have given us food for thought, Herr Delon. And then you then worry that they'll take it even a step further, this whole whites were taught violence by blacks. 
and it will explain a rather fucked up version of apartheid, in which the whites were told by the blacks to impose apartheid on them. So you can imagine the Dutch settlers who shipped up, who shipped up to occupy South Africa, they'd ship up and go, you're all right, mate. The thing is, right, we've come from fucking Holland, and we're fed up, what, with all the tolerance and the cool exit, yeah? Because two months ago, I used to talk like this. Yeah, she's a very hot place, Shende. <laughs> I'm, I'm fed up of having an action that sounds like I'm organizing a party no matter what I'm saying. <laughs> I don't, I don't mean to be rude, mate, yeah, but I really don't mind just getting a bit of your country on a loan basis. Nothing permanent. Uh, if that's all right with you. Oh, don't worry, sir. You can come and live in... Oh, we are primitive people. You can come and live in the nice places, and we will go and live in the shitty places. <laughs> we are also very excitable people. You can massacre us every two or three years. <laughs> Guys, uh, that's been my time. Thank you very much. Uh... <laughs>